Good morning, ladies. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We are coming in a day late with Bible study this week simply because <clears throat> my husband and I took a trip over to or up to Dwight, Illinois yesterday because there's a sweet little lady up there named Miss Lena Woodward. And that woman is a prayer warrior, let me tell you. And a few years ago when we were up there, I think my husband might have been preaching or singing for Brother Woodward, we had the opportunity to meet his sweet mom. And she showed us a prayer book that she has. And I'm telling you, it put me to shame, put my prayer life to shame. You know, we have our prayer lists and we have names on them and things that we pray about. But this woman has an album, like it's it's a very large photo album and it has all these pockets, these pages with pockets. And in each pocket, I think each page might hold eight, like it looks like a photo might hold eight, like little pockets. And each pocket is a card. And on that card is the name of a preacher or a missionary or probably other, I don't know who all, maybe family members or people she's met, people that she wants to pray for. And it'll have your name, your address, what your ministry is, um, your children's names, your anniversary, um, and special prayer requests. And so I know that she has prayed for us, and she's not been well, and she has been a quilt maker extraordinaire. When we were there the first time in her little apartment that her son... Uh, created for her all of her quilting equipment was set up and I so admired it I I never have picked up quilting um I would I would have loved to do something like that had somebody ever taken the time to teach me or or me just been aggressive being aggressive in learning it but I always admire somebody that knows how to do that kind of thing and uh I think we might have commented, boy, what a treasure it would be to one day own a quilt by Miss Lena, you know, and we kind of just left it at that. And lo and behold, here in the recent weeks or months or whatever, she made a little quilt for Pastor Tharp and had a little, um, a little tag uh, affixed to the back of it that said was made by her for him, you know, had the date, I think, just so precious. And it meant so much to us that we got in the car yesterday and drove six and a half hours up there to Dwight to see her and spend a little bit of time with her and to receive that quilt from her hands personally. And we brought that back and what a treasure, such a sweet visit with her. And so I knew it, you know, we'd be spending 18 hours on the road yesterday and I just, I couldn't imagine trying to record in the car. And so I thought, well, I just, I texted the ladies in my group and said, Hey, Bible study is going to come in a day late this week. So I hope you don't mind, but it was a treasure. That visit was well worth every hour that we spent driving there and back. So, <clears throat> but today we are going to continue on in our Bible study in Philippians. Today we're in Philippians chapter two, verses one through four. And I won't take the time to go back over last week's lesson. If you want to catch up a little bit, just go back and listen to last week's lesson again to refresh your memory about what we studied. But in the beginning, when we first started studying the book of Philippians, um, we could we saw that Paul talked a lot about his experiences. But then here now in our studies in chapter 2, we see he's switching the focus to the believers in the church and their attitudes toward one another. And he starts talking to them a little bit about unity among the believers. And last week I mentioned that there were two ladies at odds with one another, Yodius and Syntyche. And he said, I beseech you that you be of the same mind. And so then we see him go on and start talking about unity among the people. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is where we're going to pick it up. And it, that says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So chapter 2 begins, <clears throat> it begins with Paul's appeal for unity among the believers. And he wanted the believers to keep bringing joy to his life as they had before. And we see that in Philippians chapter 1 verses 4 through 6. He wanted them to bring joy to his life as they had before by their Christ-like living. And those verses say, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy, 
for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we see there in verse 1, the word if, and that means since or in view of the fact. So Paul based his appeal for unity among the believers on some things that um, that they had experienced in the relationship with Christ. And those were, number one, since you've experienced the consolation or the gentle encouragement of the Lord, be of one mind. God has done much for us. He's blessed us. He's given us so much. There's so many reasons to be of one mind, not striving against one another. Secondly, since you've experienced the comforting love of Christ, to be of one mind. Since you are indwelt by the same Holy Spirit as other believers, be of one mind. You don't have one Holy Spirit and me have a different one. We, we all, if we know the Lord is our Savior, have the same Holy Spirit. Um, fourthly, since you know and have experienced in your heart the kindness and mercy of Christ, be of one mind. Bowels were considered the seat of the emotions back then. I know it means something different today, but back then it was dealing with the emotions. And so there's so many reasons. These are just four. So many reasons for us to be of one mind. Nobody's better than anybody else. Honestly, we just need to. And I, and I went back and watched my video from last week and I'm like, Wow, I say the word honestly a lot. I need to stop that. <laughs> you ever watch yourself or listen to yourself and, you, and you've and realized these little ticks and habits that you get into? I remember when I first started recording Bible study, I thought, wow, I clear my throat a lot. <laughs> I think sometimes we're our own worst critic. But I did notice last week that I said the word honestly a lot. So I'm going to really try to keep that to a minimum today. Sorry about that. <laughs> In verse 2, we see that Paul gives a command, <clears throat> and he says there in verse 2, Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And that command that Paul gave was be like-minded. Be the same, have the same focus. And there are three things that contribute to like-mindedness doesn't happen by osmosis. It takes a little bit of work <laughs> if you want it. And those three things are love, one accord, and one mind. Those three things all contribute to being like-minded. And if you want to do a, a Bible study, this would be a good one for you to do. I don't have the time to dissect it all and go off um, on, um, not a rabbit trail, but I don't have the time to dissect and, and study each one individually. <clears throat> but this would be good for you. So if you took the word love and study out, how does that contribute to being like, how would love contribute to being like-minded? Just simple love for the brethren, love for each other. How would that help you to be like-minded? And then being in one accord, how would that contribute to being like-minded? And then having one mind, how would that contribute to being like-minded? Very good study if you wanted to take the time to do that. I would encourage it. To love the whole world for me is no chore, but my only real problem is my neighbor next door. And when I quote that little poem, I I think, wow, we have the best neighbors of that anybody could possibly have because we live next door to the sweetest family, and Megan's probably watching the Bible study right now. But um, when, it, when the Bible is talking about your neighbor, it doesn't mean the person that lives physically right next door to you. Your neighbor is people that you interact with. It's the, it's the lady at the grocery store that checks out your groceries. And you know, isn't it tempting these days when, because we're so busy, always in a rush, we always, have, we always have somewhere to go, always moving on to the next thing. Aren't you tempted to go through self-checkout? I am. I do it way too much. Um, but I feel like sometimes that's such a selfish thing to do because what it does is it robs me of the opportunity to deal one-on-one -on -one with that cashier if I went through her lane to talk with her and give her a track and just invite her, talk to her about the Lord. It, it robs me of that opportunity. God gives it to me, but you know, in my flesh and mind, I have something to do. I'm, I'm, I'm in such a hurry. I'm so important. I have to get to the next thing, you know, that I go through self-checkout, self-checkout. I take my self's groceries, put them in my car and go on to my next thing, you know, and in the process, I'm, I'm missing out on the opportunity to do for someone else, to do for a, 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 an other person. Um, what does being of one accord or of one mind mean to you? Well, it actually means being one in spirit, one, one purpose, one focus. And it doesn't mean 
it doesn't mean that we never have differing views or opinions. We're not robots. We're not all, we, we weren't, we're not cookie cutter people. God created us different for a reason. <laughs> My husband often says, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this. He often says, well, this one's kind of funny. He often says, if I was married to a person like myself, I'd probably kill myself. <laughs> or he talks about how similar personalities sometimes, you know, if they were if they were made it up together, that probably one would kill the other. <laughs> and so I love how God created us um, with different personalities, you know. And my husband and I, we, uh, we balance each other out, you know. He our personalities couldn't be more different, but it works, doesn't it? And your marriage may be the same way, you know, you complement one another. And if you both were very, very decisive, very strong-willed, you know, just pulling in, it just, you, there may be quite a bit of conflict there. But usually there's one that's a little indecisive, one that's very decisive, you know, I don't know. It just works. I, I can't explain it. We go together like salt and pepper, like peanut butter and jelly. He would want to add mayo, not me. <laughs> That's where we differ. Um, but I love how God created us with personality and we're all different. But that being said, even though we have different, um, different personalities, different makeups, um, we can still pull in the same direction. If you think of a physical body, it's all one body, isn't it? But if the eye were to say, I think I'll go over here and do my own thing. You, you know, your feet and legs and hands, you have fun doing your thing. I'm going to go, it doesn't work that way. Or what if the big toe decided it wanted to go do its own thing and it just quit functioning with the body and it decided to do its own thing. Now, some of us that have crippled up feet may feel that way, that our, that our big toe is doing its own thing. <laughs> but you get the picture. A body that is in harmony and unity and just works together, it gets so much more accomplished, doesn't it? <clears throat> but um, being one in spirit and purpose, that, that is what being of one mind means. <clears throat> what causes discord instead of one accord? Well, if you look at verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. So the thing that causes discord is strife and vainglory. <clears throat> and we see, um, I know I keep referring to it, but Paul, that's one thing that he commanded was that nothing be done through strife and vainglory. So if you look up those words, strife and then vainglory in the dictionary, um, we can see a little bit how each one of those can cause discord. So the word strife, that literally means bitter or violent conflict or dissension, contention for superiority. And boy, don't we see that a lot. Um, we see that in marriage, marriages. We see that sometimes in the home. We see it in the workplace. We see it at church. And so contention for superiority. And this causes discord because both sides feel that they're right and often a spirit of despising or envy is the basis for strife. And so <clears throat> this is something that we dealt. I wish you could see behind the scenes here. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but <clears throat> my camera keeps slowly lowering. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it tight and in one place, you know, but <laughs> after a few minutes, I find myself like sinking down in my chair because the camera's going lower. It's so stinking funny. But every once in a while, I have to like pause the video to put it back where it belongs and hope that it stays. <clears throat> but I kind of have it in a weird position right now, but I'm hoping it'll cooperate. And right now I feel like I'm crooked, but hey, I'm just going to work with it. Um, <clears throat> but strife, um, like I said, it's bitter or violent conflict or dissension, contention for superiority. And don't you see that so much? Oh, I hate to see that when when... One person feels like, I want to be superior. I want to be in charge. I'm more important than you. I know more than you. And it causes a lot of strife when that happens, when a person wants to be superior. Vainglory is pride or conceit because of one's accomplishments. Pride causes discord because what takes over? It's the big I, doesn't it? The big I takes over and it says, I demand my rights. I know I'm right. Why should I have to take this? And and if anybody could have said that, Paul could have. Why do I have to take this? I haven't done anything wrong. Do you know who I am? I'm a Roman. And but 
when we start getting that kind of mindset that I don't have to take this, um, I demand my, I'm, I'm a person, look at me, see me, you know, I'm important, don't you see me? And, I, and I'm not mocking, maybe a little bit, I might be mocking a little bit, um, <clears throat> but why should I have to take this? That is vainglory. And that is not, that's not a humbling of our spirit like we're instructed to do. And boy, this is one thing that we dealt so hard on our kids about when they were growing up with it was this issue of pride. And all of them were taking piano lessons. And then as they got older, they started taking voice lessons. And you could, you could tell that God had blessed them with talent. God had blessed them with talent. It wasn't something that they worked up on their own. And yes, they sing like their dad, but... You know, this is something that God did for you. And so whenever you play an instrument or sing a song, you know, and you do a good job or whatever, make sure that's, make sure you're doing that for the Lord. And if somebody comes up to you and says, wow, you have such a beautiful voice or you played that piano so beautifully or, you know, they compliment them, which people are want to do. Don't you dare say thank you. <laughs> that is taking all of glory on yourself. And so we instructed them from a very little age that when somebody compliments you like that, you'd say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's because of him that I'm able to do this, you know? And so, and I, when I teach my Sunday school girls, I tell them that as well, you know, because they need to learn what it means to, um, about this matter of vain glory, taking all, all of what belongs to God, taking it for ourselves is so wrong. And so those um, those two things, strife and vainglory, just being full of pride or feeling self-important, those are kind of things that can cause discord in a, in a, in a marriage and in a home and in a church and in the workplace even. Um, there are some antidotes for strife and vainglory, and they're found in um, Philippians 2, verse 3. I want to make sure I had the right one here. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, and that says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. And, and we have read this a few times now. But sometimes, you know, in a Bible study like this, the more you read it, the more it gets in there in your in your mind and in your heart. And it finally sinks into the noggin, you know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't you have to read? Sometimes when I just even read a book, I'll be reading along and all of a sudden I'll look out the window or I'll have a thought about, oh, I wonder what I should, you know, I maybe should take some meat out of the freezer for dinner or, you know, your mind starts to wander. And so then I'll go back and reread what I just read. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. I don't know. But sometimes when you read something three or four or five times, finally, the meaning of that sinks down into your heart and mind and you begin to apply it to your life. But let's read it again. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, hum, that's humble, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so 1 Peter 5, 5 says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Um, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And then Romans 15, 1, he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And so um, some of the antidotes are, firstly, to humbly consider others better than yourself and submit to one another. And <clears throat> I know... I don't know what you've heard taught or preached in the past, but um, my husband, when he teaches through the passage about submitting to one to another, that happens even in the marriage relationship. It's not the man, you know, dragging the wife around by her hair and saying, you'll do what I say. You know, you don't ever question me. It's her submitting to him, him submitting to her, you know, and it's not the wife, you know, making herself, you know, large and in charge of everything. It's not, it's not that submitting to one another. I value your opinion, what you say about this, what you think about this for each other. And that, and that works in the family with our children. It works with our, you know, our neighbors. It works in the workplace and in the church, you know, just valuing other people. God created them and we're to love them like he loves them and work with them and have unity and peace with one another, not strife. Um, so firstly is to humbly consider others better than yourselves. 
and submit to one another. Secondly, look not only on your own interests, but also consider the interests and needs of others. <clears throat> Live to please others, not yourself. There's so much joy in living for others rather than yourself. I know you might think <laughs> that, that to live your life to please yourself is the where it's at, but that's against the Bible. The Bible says live to please, or the Bible says putting others first. And <clears throat> that is where you'll find real joy. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we hear and read about the importance of a proper self-image and truly I'm very tired of the self-promotion that I see in the world. Aren't you? So much self-promotion. <clears throat> it's very backwards from what God wants for us. And I think I started realizing this, oh, I don't know, it's probably been several years now, when Facebook really began, like, being huge. And <clears throat> when I first noticed it was the selfie craze. And I remember thinking, what on earth? I'm so tired of seeing so many teenage girl selfies and this was when I was on Facebook I hate it now I, I really I rarely ever get on there um but so many I, I remember thinking I'm so tired of seeing so many teenage girls so if I have to see another one I'm gonna probably be sick but then it became everybody everybody started doing it uh, everybody was like look at me look at my new hairdo look at look at look at how I can do makeup you know and they're doing their makeup on videos and people were watching it and um, look what I'm eating for dinner look what I'm wearing look at where I'm at on vacation look at this look at that you know it was all look at me look at look at what I'm doing today you know and uh, I just felt like it, it takes so much focus off of where it should be and that's on the Lord and it puts the focus on you on on yourself and what you have going on and it's kind of funny because here I'm sitting in front of a camera teaching a Bible study <laughs> But I hope, you know, if I could teach this, like sitting behind a screen, I'd be so much happier. <laughs> I do not like doing anything in front of people. And it kind of helps that it's a recorded thing. <clears throat> but the selfie craze, you know, and promoting self, it just gets really, I get really weary of that. And it is just very backward from what God wants for us. In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, and we've read that verse several times about let nothing be done through strife and being glory, that teaches us what a biblical view of self-image really is, um, and it's um, being lowly in mind and esteeming others better than us, putting someone else ahead of you, not being first all the time with everything. Be last. Be a servant. No, you go first. And boy, there are times when it gets tough, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe you're prone to road rage. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you ladies drive. I remember one time I was coming home from work, and uh, this was when I still worked out of town at Edible Arrangements, and I was coming home, and I was in a hurry. I had worked later than I wanted to, and I was coming home late, and I needed to get over on my exit because I wanted to go to Walmart, and I inadvertently cut off a car, and come to find out it was one of our other ladies from church, Christina. <laughs> I felt so bad about that. But that is not esteeming others better than myself. I should have said, no, no, you go first. <laughs> but that was one of my failures. Um, <clears throat> but also in Matthew 20, verse 26, we see, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. So a biblical view of self puts others and their interests before myself and my interests. It's a servant mindset. So humbling myself to serve others. And remember that little acronym for joy, Jesus, first, others, second, then you. If you want real joy, peace, and contentment, that is the way to achieve it. Always honoring God first and foremost. That's the way to a happy life, to a happy marriage, to a happy family, happy friendship, a happy church. <laughs> that's the way. So have you ever asked yourself the question, who controls me? When I let the actions of others determine my reactions, I'm controlled by every person that I meet. And my husband has talked about this so many times. How can I break that miserable habit and cycle that binds me? Well, I need to change my mind about myself and quit thinking about myself and start thinking more of others. I need to stop being so self-centered and so self-protective and 
Trust me, I know that we all battle this from time to time because I know this because we're all made of the same sinful flesh. And I want to be spirit controlled, not others controlled, don't you? So <clears throat> I know that because you're made of the same sinful flesh that I am. And if if you have a right heart, you want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not others. You don't want to be controlled by others. And so here are some steps you can take to achieve the goal to be spirit controlled. So <laughs> I hear him coming. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him come in the door and I paused the video. <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs> uh, he told me yesterday we were driving along in the car and we're going to be in Texas next week. And so I immediately thought, oh no, another another time that I need to figure out how I'm going to record my latest Bible study. And he said, just record it in the car. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, while that would be fun, funny probably, <clears throat> I don't know how fun it would be. <laughs> I feel like it would be kind of a, you know, sideshow circus. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll record early for next week. But anyway, if to be spirit controlled, here are some steps you can take to achieve that goal. The first one would be to admit that my reactions have revealed how self-centered I am. And that's a tough one to, to, to admit that I've been self-centered and selfish. The second one is to refuse to excuse and defend my actions. And that's a that's a hard one too, because our flesh likes to do that. We immediately go to the defense of ourself and we like to make excuses for our sin. And then <clears throat> thirdly, confess our sin of self-centeredness and then live by Philippians 2 verse 3, which says again, and I know we've hammered away pretty heavily at that verse in this lesson, but again, it says, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And so if you do that, if you take those steps, you'll be well on your way to living a much happier life. And the Lord, he loves to dwell in a quiet and peaceable heart, not one that's full of strife and vainglory. Um, strife and vainglory, those are the things that will hinder us from seeing him and sensing his presence, even when he's right beside us and trying to speak to us. <clears throat> Self drowns all of that knowledge and that sweet comfort out. And so just get it confessed and forgiven and, and move on and make your life about others, not about yourself. Is there discord in your marriage? Maybe with a child, maybe another family member, and Lord help, maybe with a church member, some kind of discord or strife between you and them. Um, think about think about three things that you can do for them. Maybe, maybe you're going to do something for your spouse or your child or this family member that you're at odds with. Maybe it's a friend or a church member. List three things that you can do for them. Just off the top of your head, ask the Lord for um, wisdom to, you know, something that you can do for them. Then pray about each item on your list and then just do it. Um, and if you do this, do it with no expectations. Just do it because it's right. Do it because you love Jesus and you love others. And <clears throat> the hard part is to do these kind is to do when you're at odds with somebody, it's tough, isn't it, to take the high road and be kind and forgiving and do something kind for them. But the Bible calls that heaping um, coals of kindness on them. And it's the way we're supposed to treat somebody that has wronged us. We're supposed to do good to them that do evil to us. And so do something, choose three things that you can do for that person and do it with no expectations. Just do it because it's right and it's kind. And if you do do that and you do get a response, like I said, don't do it with any expectations. But if you do get a response, I would love to know what happens. <laughs> I would just to see how things worked in your situation there after you after you tried that but um, if you don't ever get a response back then just do it because it's right and because you love Jesus you know but anyway that's all the time we have for today thank you for joining me next week I will be in Texas my husband's preaching for brother Graf down there and uh, <clears throat> I'm excited excited to go away with him we were down there a couple years ago I think with them and we're gonna go back again this year so we'll be with the, the graphs next week and I will carve out a time somewhere to, to do latest Bible study so so that we won't be coming in late again next week but thanks for joining me today if you're new today 
If somebody has shared the video with you and this is your first time, please take a second to introduce yourself down in the comment section. Tell me who you are, maybe who invited you. And if you'd like to have the study notes, I'd love to send them to you. I send them out over email. And so if that's you, if you would just drop me a note over my email, which will be down in the description box, drop me a note, tell me who you are and that you'd like the study notes and I'll be sure to get those sent to you. So thanks for joining me today. Hope you have a lovely day. Today is Wednesday for uh, most of you that are watching today. And so we'll be heading to um, midweek prayer service here in just a little bit. So look for somebody to be a blessing to today and look for somebody to get the gospel to today. I'll see you next Tuesday.